Hi, this is Rich Terrell at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, back for continuing coverage of the Galileo arrival at Jupiter. We've had a successful morning, or uh, actually uh, afternoon, with the uh, a, a successful lockup of the probe data with the orbiter. Uh, that mission is now completed, and uh, that data is hopefully stored on Galileo spacecraft. Uh, coming up will be the main orbit insertion, uh, the Jupiter JOI, where the, we'll fire the engine at about 5.19. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, that is the Earth Receive Time. Uh, at 6.08, the engine will shut off, uh, leaving Galileo in an orbit around Jupiter, and we'll have a wrap-up press conference at 6.45. To remind you again, you can contact us via the uh, uh, Internet at www.jpl.nasa.gov or um, the Galileo homepage at www.jpl.nasa.gov slash Galileo. FTP address is FTP jpl.nasa.gov and electronic bulletin board at, uh, with a modem on the phone number 818-354-1333. Also, we have an uh, uh, email address at newsdesk at jpl.nasa.gov or we can, you can fax us at 818-354-4537. Those home pages are pretty crowded right now and uh, good luck trying to get on them, but uh, they will be available to you at any time uh, after this as well. Uh, joining me, uh, we have uh, several guests. We have Wes Huntress from uh, NASA headquarters, the associate administrator of the Office of Space Science, uh, Torrance Johnson, the uh, uh, project scientist for Galileo, and uh, Bob Mitchell, the uh, Science and Sequence Office Manager. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, had an incredible day so far and uh, still incredible things to come. Reactions? What a rush. <laughs> <laughs> what a rush is right. One big one down, one more to go. One, well, the big one to go. In fact, the big one um, to go is the main uh, orbit engine uh, burn, and that has happened, or that is happening right now. And we won't know about it for another uh, uh, few minutes because of the light time that it takes for, uh, for these signals to get to the Earth, and that's 52 minutes at a half a billion miles. In fact, in this case, with the burn lasting 49 minutes, it'll be completely done before we see the beginning of it. Right, right. And uh, let's see, that, that's, uh, that 49 minute burn, when, uh, when, when we see that, uh, that image of the rocket going off, it's a 400 Newton engine. And uh, you know, give us an idea of what, is that a, a powerful acceleration? Is that, uh, is that a gentle nudge? It's a pretty gentle nudge. Relative to the small thrusters that we've used to navigate so far, it's quite a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. But 400 Newtons in what probably is more common units is about 100 pounds. And the spacecraft at this point is still massive enough that that amounts to about 1 40th of a G. So it's a pretty gentle ride. Yeah, I, I but understand. it is constant. That's, it's not like we're bumping it like that. We're going to keep pushing it like that for 49 minutes. And that's what's going to slow us down. Right. right. I understand that uh, that would be a, a speed of about uh, uh, 0 to 60 in uh, 2 minutes, right. well, which is, isn't very fast. But if you do that for 49 minutes at that acceleration, right. you're going to go pretty far. Okay. Um, do we uh, do we have? Uh, we'd like to actually go around the uh, the laboratory right now and uh, see what the, is going on at the MSA, the uh, Mission uh, Science Area, and uh, we see that now. And uh, Bill O'Neill uh, should be there. Actually, we are uh, going to try to get a link up with uh, with them. Uh, are we ready for that, or uh, we're not ready for that? We'll, we'll be going back there and uh, and looking at reactions uh, for uh, for the uh, engine burn, and that will be coming up uh, uh, shortly. Um, okay, uh, Wes, you have... Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of take this opportunity that you all given me here to, to, uh, to welcome all the guests that have come here to, to JPL. Now, I've been coming to these things for a long time. I worked at the laboratory for, for 20 years, watching all these things happen from Mariner 6 all the way up through Voyager in uh, 89, the last encounter at Neptune. Magellan and now Galileo, uh, and these things are always exciting. And so I'd like to especially welcome those uh, who are coming for the first time and who have never seen, you know, that the, the real human event that this is. I was out there uh, for the probe entry, uh, and um, I don't know if you've got to see the reaction yet uh, there, but it was tumultuous. Uh, and it was the, uh, the feelings were palpable. Uh, and you sit there and, and you're, you're calm, you're waiting for it to happen, uh, and as soon as that happens and you see uh, Bill O'Neill's hands go up, 
behind the booth, it just wells up, uh, and you can't mm -hmm. help it. It's it's a wonderful experience. Uh, it's it it happens, you know, not that often. We're going to try to make it happen more often than it's happened in the past. Uh, and so I hope those of you who came here for the first time today get a chance to come back uh, and see this kind of event happen in planetary exploration more often. Uh, and we're not done yet. We've got one more to go here yet. Right. One more exciting event. Actually, two more, the engine on and the engine off. Right. Uh, Torrance, uh, what, uh, what's up for your, uh, what, what's next for you in, uh, in terms of the day's events? Well, waiting for JOI is uh, the, our big looking forward now. And as uh, you said, we've got to get JOI started. we got to get it stopped on time. That program is all on board. The spacecraft is operating beautifully. We have good signal from it. Every confidence that will work right. And then we'll be the first artificial satellite of Jupiter. And we can look forward to getting the probe data back in the next few uh, weeks and months. And uh, then uh, looking forward to um, even beyond that horizon to uh, next July when we come in for our first ever uh, encounter with one of the Jupiter moons with our first Ganymede encounter in July. Mm -hmm. oh, that's going to be great. And it's a two-year orbital tour. Two-year so orbital uh, tour. And we'll be taking data pretty much continuously. Once the data pipeline opens, when we get to, um, uh, to Ganymede, <coughs> we'll be getting data back virtually every day with really new eye-opening things about the Jupiter system on the ground every day. And uh, we expect to have a first look at the probe data even earlier than that, of course, by uh, the 19th of December. That's terrific. Um, I understand we're ready for uh, Bill O'Neill at the uh, MSA. Uh, Bill, can you hear us? Hello. Hi, Bill. Uh, this is uh, you're on uh, you're on camera. Give us a wave and uh, what's happening. <laughs> we'll all give you a wave, and we're we're having a great time here. Want to welcome everyone to uh, the guest operations. Uh, about to witness with us uh, the momentous event of the first spacecraft going into orbit about Jupiter. And we are just uh, ecstatic already because we have confirmed that indeed the probe was successful. It radiated a signal to us. The most difficult entry ever attempted has been accomplished. So it's just a wonderful afternoon, but a very well-earned afternoon. And uh, you can see all of us here are, are just uh, beaming with the light, but uh, it's been a long time coming. Well, you're all to be uh, incredibly congratulated. It was, a, it was a, a great monumental achievement, and we've got uh, one more monumental achievement to go just today. And that'll be uh, pretty quickly now, and we're just about completed with the spin-up maneuver preparatory to lighting the main engine. And uh, we can we have every reason to expect that we'll see another stunning performance uh, from our, our German uh, propulsion module. Okay, we'll be uh, looking over your shoulder in about another 10 minutes uh, to see how uh, things are going. Roger that. Okay, terrific. Uh, we're uh, well on our way to receiving those signals for the uh, Jupiter uh, orbit insertion. Um, I guess uh, oh, w let's talk a little bit about that uh, orbit insertion. It's a 49-minute it's a burn, but... Uh, I mean, if we, if we burn for 40 minutes, would we still be happy? Would we still achieve uh, Jupiter orbit? Or what, what, what is the, uh, the leeway there? There's not a lot of leeway. And if we burn for 40 minutes and stopped, we wouldn't be very happy. The, it takes the majority of the burn just to change the orbit from being a hyperbolic orbit to an elliptic so orbit. To capturing. Right, the, right. To, the point to where it's captured and it'll stay in orbit about Jupiter requires that almost all the burn be done. And then just the last few minutes, very few minutes, are what bring it from a captured orbit down to the orbit that we need with a period of just a little over 200 days. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all got to happen. So we really want to see those 49 minutes. That's right. We're pretty close to it. That's right. Good. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm just anxious right now to see that Doppler plot and see the thing turn the corner and start um, going down there where it's supposed to go. We all are. <laughs> Believe me, we all are. Uh, in fact, uh, let's go to uh, David Seidel, who should be at the uh, Navigations Operations Area. Uh, David, are you ready? Yes, Rich. Uh, this is one of the places where people have a tremendous vested interest in what's going on. This is the Galileo Hello, Navigation Area. Yes, can you hear me, Rich? 
This is, a, this is the Galileo navigation area. These are the navigators have gotten the spacecraft uh, through its v Vega trajectory, uh, Venus, Earth, Earth, and then Ida, Gaspar encounters, and then to Jupiter. They don't have any, uh, any particular responsibilities per se at the moment. The spacecraft trajectory is well determined by the laws of physics, but they're on the edge of their seats because their future depends on the successful JOI burn, of course, as does the rest of the team. If uh, we have a successful JOI burn, which everyone expects, mm -hmm. then their, their work will begin anew because they have designed the orbital tour as the spacecraft orbits around Jupiter and flies by the moons, and they'll be refining and tweaking that so we get the best possible science at each of the encounters. And we'll be coming back to this site to get their reactions throughout the JOI burn. Okay, thank you, David. Um, let's see, I think uh, we're also going to have a, uh, an animation now, and maybe, Torrance, you can uh, address that. This is the uh, uh, orbital uh, tour, I believe, that uh, we're going to be showing. Now, this is starting off, I think, with us being right over, right over Jupiter. The uh, uh, animation now shows the, uh, the 400 Newton engine lighting off, which we hope we'll get confirmation of in just a few minutes here. And then a few hours later, uh, we go behind Jupiter, as seen from the Earth and the Sun, in, into the shadow of Jupiter, actually. This is uh, an animation showing that. Now, we'll be measuring, continuing to measure the radio signal as we go behind Jupiter and come out again. That'll give us a lot of information about the upper atmosphere of Jupiter from uh, what we call a radio occultation experiment. We've done these before, but as we know, Jupiter is a dynamic place. The clouds and structure of the atmosphere is different at different latitudes and different times. And so this will be one of our first steps to understanding the atmosphere of Jupiter just from using the radio signal that we're communicating with. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, we've got actually a question here from the uh, internet. Um, and the question is, uh, how many years is the orbiter expected to send data from the Jovian system? Well, the nominal orbital mission, as we call it, that is the planned orbital mission, is uh, approximately uh, 24 months by the time we, uh, uh, we finish the mission. We'll be finishing our uh, uh, assigned mission in about December of 1997. And uh, that will encompass 11 orbits or 11 encounters of satellites during the, um, uh, during the, the tour, plus a lot of other observations. Now, we probably won't run out of gas precisely on that date and we'll still have power left. We believe that we've designed the spacecraft to survive the radiation environment. We don't know what we would do after that, but at some point, fairly soon thereafter, we'd lose uh, control over the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's still, a, it's still a satellite of Jupiter, of course. It doesn't fall out of orbit or anything like that. But probably within the next few years or hundreds of years, it would either hit Jupiter's atmosphere or run into one of the satellites mm -hmm. if it were uncontrolled. Bob may have an idea about approximately how long that would last. It depends a lot on what orbit we leave it in at mm -hmm. the time we finish uh, uh, trying to control the spacecraft. So after the nominal two-year mission, there, there may be some uh, attitude control fuel left over to do further, uh, further right. tours and further orbits. Right. Uh, one of the other questions we had, which actually kind of leads right into that, is um, um, First of all, it says congratulations on the Jupiter project, but it says, um, will, will there be another chance to get uh, closer views of Io after today? Well, one thing to remember is that uh, the mission did lose its very highest resolution views of Io that we had hoped to take today. Uh, but we had planned a very extensive study of Io during the entire mission. Io is a volcanic dynamic place. Its surface is changing every day. We know this from both the Voyager data and from studying it with telescopes and the Hubble Space Telescope from the Earth. And uh, what we have to do with Galileo is a chance every month, essentially, to take a really close look at Io. And we come in very close to Io, actually, on every orbit. So we have, in essence, an Io volcano observatory built into the mission, and we're very excited about looking forward to that. Now, we will be looking toward the end of the tour at the possibilities for whether we could go back even closer to Io later on. Mm -hmm. In fact, even before we had uh, uh, the difficulty that stopped us from taking the data today on Io, um, we had been looking at that as a potential way to end the mission because Io has always been exciting to us. Right. But we don't know what we'll decide to do until after we're in orbit. We're hoping to have surprises and discoveries ahead of us, and exactly what we decide is the, uh, is the best thing to follow up on those discoveries will depend a lot on what we see. So mm -hmm. everybody can stay tuned, take a look at it, and uh, put their own vote in is what they think is interesting. Terrific, mm -hmm. terrific. Maybe we can even vote over the yeah. Internet. Um, we're, uh, 
We're coming up on uh, about three minutes away from, uh, from the time where we would expect to get uh, confirmation that the uh, uh, engine is burning. Uh, maybe we can look at the Doppler plot just to get an idea ahead of time on uh, what we'll be looking at. Uh, and here it, here it is. And uh, Bob, maybe you want to explain a little bit about what we're seeing here, what we might expect to see? Okay. Well, the line that you're seeing going across the top represents the difference between what we have predicted that we will see, knowing mm -hmm. what the trajectory is going to be, and what we are actually seeing as the data comes in. The data is a frequency measurement. The spacecraft is transmitting a signal to us, a mm -hmm. radio signal at a known frequency. But because of the speed, because of its motion relative to us along the line of sight, we actually see a different frequency than that. And right. so what we're showing here is the difference between the frequency that we really see and what we predicted that we would see. So this translates directly into a change in velocity in, so, the, in the spacecraft as this changes from that line. So when, when well, we see a change from that line, we're going to know that uh, there's something going on in the spacecraft that the engine is burning. That is right. The, all right. Now, normally, if we kept going with this predicted behavior all the way across, you'd see nothing but a straight line all the way across. Right. But seeing nothing isn't very reassuring. When something <laughs> happens, you'd like to see something change. Right. We're, we're going to go to some reaction shots around the laboratory as people uh, uh, anxiously await um, what's going on. This is uh, von Karman Auditorium, and they're watching the clock and uh, watching that same Doppler plot we are. That's good enough. There are propulsion people down in front. This is the NAV conference area.
What you're seeing right now is the difference between what we would have gotten had the engine not fired and the actual data coming back from the spacecraft. So that says something's happening right now on the spacecraft, which is moving it, and that is the engine firing. going to be audio. No, no. Go back to you. Okay. Hi. Well, we've, we've done it. Uh, we've got confirmation of the uh, Galileo uh, orbit insertion burn, at least beginning. We've got 49 minutes of that to go uh, before we'll really be uh, in a safe orbit around Jupiter. So it's a very, very exciting moment. The second big hurdle of the day, the engine starting, and now we just have to wait and make sure it, it fires long enough. It's Torrance, you've waited a long time for this moment. It's really great to be having got to our target and now we're going to stay at our target. We're going to stay at our target, <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully, we're, we're well on the way there. The Doppler plot looked good. Um, was it as expected? Yes, yeah. So far, it's just exactly as expected. It looks like it's doing just the right thing. It, uh, there's, you always have to wonder. You, you really think it's going to work, but until you really see it, it's a bit of a concern. Let's, um, can, can we go to the MSA and, uh, and, and find a reaction there? Hello, uh, whoop. he just hung up. We turn back to you. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, right, we're, uh, we're on our way trying to contact the uh, mission uh, support area. And uh, can you guys uh, hear us over at the MSA? Over. Hello, can you hear us at the MSA? Are you reading me? This is Neil Osmond in the MSA. Hey, Neil, we read you clearly. Uh, congratulations. Uh, thanks a lot. Everything's going good so far. Um, we spun up as we expected to about 10.42 RPM, and uh, the maneuver started right on time, and everything looks great so far. Okay, so now we just wait and uh, find out whether we get the 49-minute burn. That's right. Uh, that's the scheduled burn, and, uh, and you'll see it first on the Doppler plots, which uh, I guess you guys are broadcasting uh, into, all of the, uh, into all the rooms. Right. We're looking at that right now, and it uh, looks good. Very, very clean signal. Right, and you can see a little, uh, a little arrow at the bottom of that, which is the, the cutoff. That's the point we're aiming at. If we get real close to that, it'll be a great burn. Terrific. Uh, once again, congratulations to uh, everyone there on the team. Done a great job. Uh, thanks a lot. <sighs> All right. <laughs> what, one thing we might point out is that when we get down to that arrow that Neil was talking about where we're going to turn the corner and level out again like it is up on top, we fully expect that we will lose lock with the DSN because of the change in frequency that's going to occur and because we don't know exactly where that occurs to tell the DSN. So if this signal goes away for a little while, people shouldn't take it down by that arrow by the corner. That shouldn't be a cause for alarm. We expect that to happen. Okay, and, and that lock is because the uh, Galileo is now going to change its, its velocity with respect to the Earth um, as the engine cuts off and you're actually tracking a different uh, uh, Doppler signature? Yes. Kind of like that. Uh, when we generate the predicts that we give to the station that, that they use to track, those predicts have to be very accurate. And we don't know just exactly where the burn is going to end because there are minor variations in the thrust level. The accelerometers will measure that and cut it off at exactly the right point. But mm -hmm. we don't know just exactly in time where that's going to occur. So the predicts that we've given to the DSN uh, probably aren't going to match exactly where it cuts off. And, uh, okay. We and, and that's because the, and now you have accelerometers on board the spacecraft, which we're actually going to measure. Once it's, it's got enough push, it'll shut the engines off. Right? Yes, so, right. Yes. So we'll, uh, we'll get that accurately. The official time is uh, 520 uh, pa uh, Pacific Standard Time. The, um, the engine, uh, we received confirmation that the 400 Newton engine uh, started as planned. Uh, it's a 49-minute burn, should burn till 6.08 p.m. And uh, again, as you pointed out, the uh, communications is expected to drop out momentarily when that burn is finished, but that is uh, that is expected. You know, it's interesting. I was noting on the timeline here, Rich, going back to the other part of this mission, the probe, 
He said, at the time when JOI was initiating on the orbiter, the probe had already lost its parachute, was dropping into the atmosphere Jupiter right. deeper, and the aluminum metal inside the probe was beginning to melt. That's right. So the probe that was with us earlier in the afternoon is rapidly in the process of becoming part of the atmosphere. That's right. That's right. It's, uh, it's rather fitting. Uh, it, uh, part of Galileo becomes part of Jupiter. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're continuing our coverage now, and uh, again, it's uh, 49 minutes. Uh, we expect the burn to last until about 6.08 p.m. Uh, if it uh, lasts that long, then we're going to be confirmed in, uh, in uh, orbit around Jupiter. Uh, we'd like to uh, go to the uh, visitor center now with uh, David Seidel, and uh, are we ready for, uh, for his interview? No, we're not. Okay, well, we'll stay here, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get an interview with Don Williams, one of the uh, shuttle astronauts that actually deployed the uh, Galileo spacecraft. Um, what else can you tell me about uh, JOI that we should know? This is just kind of a watch and wait period for all of us, you know. It's, it's <laughs> kind of interesting thinking about this. Is that you think about rocket launches as being things that go boom, and you know, the thing goes up. It's just a gentle push. It, uh, this is a gentle push, and it just lasts a long time. And uh, we're just sitting here like everybody else. Uh, spacecraft, I think that one thing that we should keep noting is the spacecraft programs, the computer programs on board the spacecraft that have been running the spacecraft all day long have just been clocking out absolutely perfectly. I mean, uh, uh, we had all had some worries that things like radiation in the environment near Jupiter might have disrupted some of those programs. The, mm -hmm. the artificial intelligence on board the spacecraft is capable of handling that and continuing with its job anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's always nice not to have to have it do that. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. the spacecraft has been behaving very well. It means that the engineering designs that went into those uh, 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 components, the electronics mm -hmm. and the way the computers work that are telling the engines when to burn and how to burn and so forth are also performing beautifully. And I, I think that's, that bodes very well for the rest of the mission. And um, do you think that this is a, a measure of conservatism in the, in the way the thing was designed, or could there be a real change in the radiation environment about Jupiter? I mean, we have seen changes in some of the other uh, environments as well. Everything we know from measurements of the um, uh, radio fluxes from Jupiter, for instance, and the Io plasma torus from the Earth suggests that the, uh, the radiation belts of Jupiter are still just as fearsome as they, they were before. I think this is just good engineering design. Uh, once we get data from our instruments on board, of course, we'll know more about the changes that might have occurred and, and so forth. But uh, uh, no, I, I think uh, uh, this just says that um, uh, the design people did it right. We've got good parts, and the parts are reacting as expected, which is not at all to the radiation environment. All right. Well, we actually have a question from uh, Escondido, California, over the Internet. Uh, actually, it was a fax, and it says, speeds, temperatures, and radiations of Galileo encounters at Jupiter sound lethal, yet the spacecraft survives at all. Well, thank goodness for that. Um, is there any chance that a space vehicle could orbit or land on one of Jupiter's moons one day, carrying humans to explore these remarkable worlds, or is it too deadly a place for human beings to go physically? Well, the answer to the first question is it certainly is possible for a spacecraft to land on the surface of these satellites. Uh, Galileo is coming close to that. The velocities at which we go by these mm -hmm. moons are not that great. And by uh, future spacecraft carrying uh, 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 probes with, a, uh, with some deceleration capability could put something on the surface. It's going to be a long time before I think we were prepared to send humans there, however, because as the correspondent mentions, is that uh, the, the, the environment really is deadly. The radiation belts are deadly. One would have to carry massive amounts of shielding to protect any future astronauts in those environments. Perhaps Callisto. Maybe Callisto. Maybe Callisto. Always, and I, I, I heard a science fiction writer say once, if an engineer tells you he can't do something because it violates the laws of physics, you might believe him. Uh, but if he says it's just very, very difficult, he'll probably be done. So uh, probably going, to, going to Jupiter's moons with humans is very, very difficult, but not impossible. Great. Um, we'd like to roll a uh, reaction shot tape of reaction f during the uh, probe entry. Don 
screen there, still tracking down, right? Confirmed 693. That's That's the confirmation. was a single yes or no. Okay, one down. That, that was a call from the probe engineering team chief, Pat Melia, which said very simply that we had indications that the orbiter receiver had locked on to a signal. Of course, we presume it's from the probe. <laughs> so. Hi, we're back uh, live. Uh, uh, Andy Ingersoll has joined us and uh, Dr. Ed Stone, the director of JPL. Welcome. Uh, Ed, this must be a proud day for you. Well, this is an exciting day. This is what it's all about. This is what everybody works so hard to make happen, and it's happened today, so it's a great, it's a great day. This has been a long time coming. I mean, this, uh, it was a torturous way to, to get to Jupiter, but we've, we're finally there. Yeah, well, and, you know, given where we were in 1986, where it wasn't clear there was any way to get to Jupiter with Galileo, it, it's and now it's clear we found a way and uh, it looks like we're going to be in orbit and we're going to have a wonderful two-year tour of the Jovian system. Well, we got to Jupiter, we just want to make sure we stay there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, that's happening right now. The Doppler plots look good. They are still going as predicted and uh, you can see them, uh, them now. Uh, the uh, small little arrow at the uh, bottom right uh, corner is where we want to be. Uh, so we're, we're about a third of the way there. Not enough to achieve orbit, but at least everything is going nominally and uh, things are looking very good. Andy, another milestone. Just like old times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually there are a lot of uh, Voyager veterans here. Right? Uh, let's talk a little bit about Voyager. That was, that was the most incredible uh, electric moment of, of being and flying past the Jupiter system. And I think all of us got a real taste of, of really wanting to go back. Uh, after the second flyby, we said goodbye to Jupiter. It was, we couldn't wait until Galileo got there. And finally, that moment's here. Uh, uh, you want to compare the, uh, the kinds of things we learned there and the kind of things we might expect? Ed? Well, I think that what the Voyager at Jupiter really showed us was how different uh, the outer solar system was than our sort of simple expectations were, and really set the stage for a whole series of discoveries as we moved out into the solar system. But Jupiter really opened our eyes. We had some very simple ideas about what we were going to see, and nature was just dramatically more interesting. Uh, and that, of course, is what Galileo will have a chance to probe in much more detail. Being there, staying there, rather than just flying by with snapshots and, uh, and, a, few, and a few other uh, bits and pieces of data in a short period of time, we're going to have two years at least to really explore uh, at much higher resolution, much greater detail, uh, the diversity which Voyager really revealed in 1979. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, given all that we know about the Earth and all the uh, effort we've spent studying the Earth, uh, extrapolating that 
to uh, Jupiter and its satellites was just, uh, it taught humility because uh, we, <laughs> couldn't, we couldn't extrapolate very well. It really did. I, I, as I said, I think the, if there was one thing that we could expect, that we grew to expect during these encounters, was to expect to be surprised. I mean, we were just yeah. blown away one thing after the other. And I'm sure there are a lot of uh, plums still to uh, to capture with. Yeah, and the Jupiter Galilee. encounter really was the start of that. I mean, I remember Ed when we were originally thinking about strategies for looking at the moons of Jupiter. It's, people thought, that, well, it might be okay to look at an ice moon and a rock moon, but then we'd have sampled everything. And we, we saw that tremendous diversity there. It's one of the things that drive us to go back and look, try to understand, and. Uh, uh, I think the same is true of the environment. If you think about going back to, to Pioneer, uh, we got a, really found out what that radiation belt was like there in terms of what we might have to experience with our electronics. Tried to harden Voyager to, uh, to survive in that environment. And I remember going by Io was real white knuckles time back then. Said, uh, we had uh, glitches going on in the flight computers and so forth. And, uh, went back again with, with Galileo and thought real hard about how to uh, uh, exist for two years in that environment. Yeah, that must have been a pretty scary time <laughs> it for was you a, as it well. Was, it was, uh, you, you always take a risk when you go into an environment like Jupiter's because uh, you can't really test the spacecraft at the level it's going to be exposed because you use up too much of its radiation okay. lifetime. So you're, you're sort of, you're extrapolating your experience saying that uh, it should survive and the Voyager did survive, although we did have a few little glitches which affected things, not seriously fortunately. Uh, and Voyager 2, we purposely moved further out as Galileo is moving, moving further out for most of its orbit in order to minimize uh, uh, the risk that we were taking with the Voyager 2, which was the spacecraft we definitely wanted to send on to Uranus and Neptune. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, but now we've, uh, we've got a spacecraft uh, in orbit, hopefully in orbit, yeah. or very close to being in orbit. Uh, let's go to the uh, mission uh, director, uh, Neil Osmond, and see if uh, we can get some other reactions there. Neil, can you uh, hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, how's the burn going? Uh, we're looking at the Doppler plot occasionally, and uh, things look good here. How's, uh, how's it look there? Uh, about nine and a half minutes into the burn, we were 0.4% under burn. Uh, as of right now, well, our telemetry is lagging a little bit as, as expected, but uh, we've uh, completed at least uh, 146 meters per second of the burn, and it's looking great. Well, that's great. 0.4% uh, is, uh, is wonderful. That's just uh, right nominal. It sure is. Okay, well, uh, keep us posted, and uh, we'll be looking for reactions on the uh, burn cutoff later. Thanks, thanks very much. All right, still, things are still going. <laughs> it's still going, like the uh, battery commercials do. Um, what else? Um, well, let's, let's go back and, uh, and, and discuss uh, a Voyager a little bit. I mean, there were some real surprises on, uh, on some of the things, particularly at Io and, uh, and Europa. Um, Galileo, hopefully, is going to fill in some of those holes, and... Uh, I understand that the resolution is uh, quite a quantum leap from what we got from, uh, from Voyager. <laughs> well, with respect to the, uh, the satellites in particular, uh, and Andy can speak to the, to the atmospheres, that the, uh, the, the satellites, the Voyager views were so stunning that we forget how crude they were in some sense, is that they were mostly global views with the resolution of a, of a kilometer or a few kilometers. That's equivalent to a global um, meteorological picture of the Earth from a weather satellite, which is great for looking at some things, but you can't see much detail down there on the ground. With Galileo, we go from that perspective to the perspective of something with Landsat resolution. That's going to be a real eye-opener for people interested in the geology of the, the planet. Now, with the atmosphere, of course, things move and Andy's the expert in that, and we've got a really good survey of things in the atmosphere at resolutions better than actually we looked with Voyager for those types of phenomena. Right, besides the probe where we get down below the cloud tops, uh, we've got a suite of instruments uh, that's never been assembled to look at an outer planet, uh, different wavelengths, and we're gonna probe beneath the clouds and uh, hope, hope we will understand the weather. Right. Um, we're going to look at a video right now of the uh, Voyager 2 encounter with Jupiter, and uh, maybe we want to uh, maybe you want to uh, narrate this and 
you've uh, you've now seen the Voyager this two encounter. Uh, we actually uh, we had three months uh, basically between March and July. Uh, to uh, reprogram some parts of the sequence on Voyager 2 so that we could look more closely at the uh, recently discovered uh, volcanic plumes on Io. So it was quite a scra scramble, as I recall, uh, doing the reprogram. We had not intended to reprogram, uh, but it was such an exciting discovery, uh, an unexpected discovery, that uh, we, did, uh, we did change the sequence at the last minute to try to recover that bit of data. And of course, it was Voyager 2 which gave us our first close-up, for Voyager at least, close-up look at Europa. Voyager 1 saw Europa at a great distance, and we knew it was white from Earth-based data. It had some peculiar markings on it, but when Voyager 2 flew by at its distance, it really became very clear how interesting and different Europa is than any other body in the solar system. Um, maybe we could call up an, an image of Europa from, uh, from the library that we have, and uh, we can talk a little bit about this. I, I understand that the difference in resolution from Europa that we, we had from Voyager to what we're going to get from Galileo is equivalent to taking a book and reading it uh, from the top of the Empire State Building if it was on the ground floor versus having it in your hand reading it. I mean, it's just an extraordinary difference in, in resolution. MD, this is Nav on MD Net. Roger. Oops. <laughs> okay, well, um, I guess uh, we don't have a Europa picture, but uh, anyway, Europa, why don't you tell us a little bit about Europa, uh, Torrance? And, Europa uh, is, to me, there. one of the strangest uh, uh, of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, one of the strangest moons anywhere, actually. It's about the size of our own moon, uh, but it looks totally different. Instead of being covered with a battered old surface of ancient lava flows, uh, it's covered with sparkling white ice. And that ice has got huge cracks in it running for, for hundreds of thousands of miles across the surface. And Europa is also heated by the tides of Jupiter as Io is, not as much, not as much, but enough probably to keep water liquid underneath that ice cover. And that's one of the, the things that we're really looking for, to, to try to understand what's going on with Europa, how thick that ice is, and whether in fact uh, uh, Europa is, is covering itself up with new flows of ice uh, continually. But one of the things that, that's developed in the past few years is a better understanding of how often things hit Jupiter. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was a good mm -hmm. example. Right. And uh, given Gene Shoemaker's latest estimates of how often things hit Jupiter, and therefore Europa, uh, it makes the surface of Europa perhaps very, very young, perhaps just millions of years old, perhaps yesterday. Here's a surface view of Europa. With, uh, that kind shows of a strange... almost very smooth, you notice. There are no mountains sticking up through that ice. There are only four or five impact craters that you can see instead of the huge impact scars that you see across the surface of most of the other moons out there. Europa's surface is almost entirely dominated by these linear features and ridges on the surface. There's nothing on Europa's surface that we saw with Voyager that was, was higher than just a, a, a couple of hundred yards high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, the lack of craters. No mountains, no, mountains, no craters, just ice. So it looks like just ice. <laughs> so. Uh, very Euro smooth ice. Very Euro smooth Europa ice. on the rocks. But, but the lack of craters really <laughs> indicates that uh, perhaps the surface is very young, or there's something and that modifies it very easily. So something has to be removing the craters. And if comets are the major thing hitting the system, like we think they are, then we should have expected, if the surface were as old, for instance, as the lunar Mare, to see many, many more mm -hmm. craters from comets hitting the surface. The fact that you don't see them there suggests that that surface and the geology underneath it has been active. And easiest way we can imagine for that to be geologically active is to have liquid water under that ice. So we could have a, uh, a second volcanically active uh, body around Jupiter with... Uh, right, only well, in this case the volcanoes may be on the floor of the ocean and we may be seeing ice volcanism as a result of those things. Right, actually incredible. Um, uh, we're looking at the MSA and uh, we're still waiting on uh, uh, till about 6.08 until we get the uh, like we're about the engine. There. Looks like yeah, we're about halfway there. Uh, again, moving toward that arrow on the lower right side, and uh, things look good. Looks like it's going toward the arrow. <laughs> um, here's a, a view of uh, of the Galilean satellites uh, compared to uh, some other uh, uh, things, and, and maybe you want to say a few words about the size of these bodies. They're really planetary sized bodies. Yeah, this, this compares uh, some of the, uh, the planets of, that we're familiar with. This is the, the, our own Earth, of course. Here's Venus, essentially the twin in size, but of course very different as the Magellan spacecraft showed us. Then we have our own uh, 
moon down here, Mercury, and Mars here. The four Galilean satellites are here, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. If these things were orbiting around the sun, closer to us than Jupiter, we'd have been sending Mariner Io's, Mariner Ganymedes. Yeah, and to we'd visit be calling them things. planets. And one of the really neat things about these gravity assist techniques and having a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter is we basically get what amounts to a to a uh, a cut rate orbiter of each one of these satellites since we go very close to these satellites on every orbit while we are orbiting Jupiter. Mm -hmm. It's a so real force multiplier. It's really going to be quite a quite a bonanza there. So the uh, uh, each each time you uh, you fly by one of these things, you can modify the. Uh, the, the orbital tour and uh, and get back to uh, another encounter. Yeah, we used to like to say that, uh, that that Voyager was sort of like a four or five cushion billiard shot to get out uh, to Neptune and beyond. This is an eleven cushion billiard shot. You thread the needle with the first encounter, and after that, the the orbit does its thing, with small perturbations that we have to worry about with our engines. Little, little tweaks. <laughs> um, is there any concern, uh, or was there any concern in flying so close to Io? We flew within uh, was. It, uh, about thousand, thousand kilometers. kilometers. Thousand kilometers. Was there any concern <laughs> about uh, running into the material? We looked at that early on. As you're aware, the plumes on Io uh, that we observed with with Voyager, uh, we saw go up to altitudes of about 300 kilometers. Basically, was the the highest ones we saw. And the physics of what drives those plumes is apparently that they're huge geysers. We don't think that geysers on Io, given the energy sources there, can get higher than that. Mm -hmm. uh, we still didn't want to go right down at 400 kilometers, so we thought 1,000 kilometers was pretty good. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we can... Uh, we're looking at uh, the MSA now, and again, people are, are waiting on uh, looking at the Doppler, Doppler plot, the same one that we were looking at. Uh, still waiting to, uh, to see, well, hopefully not seeing any de deviations in it <laughs> until we get to the uh, full... 49 minutes of that uh, plot, but things uh, still appear to be looking good. Uh, we got a question, another question from uh, um, the uh, internet. Actually, it was faxed to us, and uh, and uh, maybe I can uh, uh, I can uh, ask uh, uh, what type of uh, propellants uh, does the orbital insertion burn on Galileo? We've seen the uh, we've seen those animations of the burn, but uh, what are what are we burning? Well, the fuel that we're burning is monomethyl hydrazine. And the oxidizer, which we have to take along because there's no oxygen there to make the fuel burn, is nitrogen tetroxide. Okay, not, not the kind of things you get at the gas station. Mm, that's right. Not what you get at the gas station. But uh, these, are, these are fairly common uh, propellants that are uh, that These are, are very common for space applications. They, uh, they ignite on contact so that once they meet in the combustion chamber and burn, the process just keeps going. Okay, so... Uh, and. and uh, so you just mix them together, they burn, and, and that's yep. it. That's it. Yep. This, uh, this uh, German rocket design, in fact, was based on a design that was successfully used in, in Earth orbit on many missions. And so uh, uh, this is a, a common type of rocket. What makes it uncommon is it's out at Jupiter now. Right. right. And uh, we're looking now at, I think, the navigation uh, area. And, uh, people are, again, still waiting on... Uh, on uh, confirmation of the uh, burn cutoff. It will be quite a few minutes before that happens, but uh, we're still looking at the lab and, uh, and uh, looking toward that area. Um, okay, and uh, so what, what's, uh, what can I say? I mean, this is <laughs> getting really nervous on, uh, on waiting on this. This is the last uh, big event of the day, uh, or is the last big event? We still have the occultation nine hours uh, after this, where we go behind uh, Jupiter. Uh, will be measurements uh, taken there in the shadow? Uh, yes, there will be. We won't have uh, uh, a lot of data on them until uh, the radio scientists uh, analyze those data. What we're doing is with other spacecraft that have gone behind Jupiter is we're measuring the way the radio signal changes as it goes into Jupiter's atmosphere as seen from the Earth and then emerges from Jupiter's atmosphere. So this will be our, our first look at the upper atmosphere of Jupiter and uh, the ionosphere of Jupiter on the mission. We ought to have some information on that in the next couple of weeks as the radio team analyzes those data. Because that data is on the ground. That data is, uh, That's is, is right Galileo here. signal That's right. coming to the ground. Right. So we'll have that. And that'll come. So we're actually nicely. using our communications device to make another type of scientific investigation. Right.
it is that much actually is the way we first discovered Io had an atmosphere right. was uh, passing the radio signal from uh, Pioneer 10 through that at very tenuous atmosphere. And we're going to be doing that again on this mission with Many Io times. also. So that we'll have another look at at how variable the ionosphere of Io is also. Okay. Um, I know. Uh, all of you want to get back to uh, to things. It's been a long day for some of you. Like I said, you were up at 4 o'clock in the morning giving interviews, and Torrance, you're probably doing the same. Uh, any final closing remarks? Well, I think this, as I said, is really what it's all about. I mean, this is really what the space program brings. It brings the opportunity to see things nobody's seen before, to learn new things, and to understand how the solar system, how the planets, how it all works. And I think that's this is the, this is the beginning of a wonderful uh, two-year journey. Great. It's, it's pure discovery. Okay. Well, thanks very much for being here. Um, we're now going to go to a, uh, a tape roll of a communications pipeline, which shows us how information gets from the probe all the way to uh, to the Earth uh, via this uh, this incredible network. It begins with an idea, a design, a plan for conducting a science experiment. Only this experiment won't be conducted in the next room or even the next country. This experiment uses an instrument hundreds of millions of miles away. This is a story of how thousands of ideas are turned into reality. It is a story of people and machines working together to send instructions to the Galileo spacecraft. How the spacecraft uses those instructions to gather science data and how that valuable data is sent back to Earth. Just as one scientist must think of many things to conduct just one experiment, so must a project like Galileo consider many issues and plans to design the specific segments of a spacecraft mission. These ideas are collected by science planning groups. These groups discuss, modify, debate and transform these designs and ideas into a plan over a period of many months or even years. Once the plan is in place, other project teams check it for feasibility and provide their inputs. Following more debate, the exact set of instructions is approved by the project for use on the spacecraft. Once approved, these thousands of instructions are placed into a single computer file known as a sequence. The project then schedules transmission of the sequence to the spacecraft, gives the sequence one last inspection, and then transfers it through the project data systems and out into the deep space network. As the sequence is received at the station, it is processed through the station's systems, transformed into radio signals, and, at long last, sent on its way to the Galileo spacecraft. The radio signals, moving at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, take almost an hour to reach the spacecraft. After their long trip, the radio signals carrying the sequence are captured by the spacecraft's receiving antenna. As the radio signals are captured by the spacecraft, they are transformed back to computer language and stored in the onboard computer for several hours or days. Once the spacecraft is in exactly the right place at exactly the right time, the sequence begins to send instructions to the instruments and other spacecraft subsystems. As if touched by invisible hands, the spacecraft swings, rotates, and spins to accommodate the ideas of the scientists and engineers back on Earth. Over the next few months, the onboard sequence will send out instructions to each of the instruments on the spacecraft. At just the right time and place in the long orbit around Jupiter, each instrument will point, click, and survey the Jovian environment and Jupiter's moons. As each instrument performs the experiments planned many years ago, they collect and then send the data to onboard storage areas. Portions of the science data are stored in the computer memory, 
and some are moved to the onboard tape recorder. At regular intervals, the sequence sends the collected science and engineering data to the spacecraft receiver system. There, the data are transformed into radio signals and sent on their way back to the eager scientists on Earth. The journey back is just as long, a little less than an hour. As the radio signals approach Earth, three DSN sites stand ready to receive and process the data. Each site has an enormous receiver, 70 meters across, specially designed to amplify the incredibly faint signals sent from the Galileo spacecraft. Each DSN site captures the spacecraft's radio signals, refines them, combines them with other station data, and then sends them to JPL. The data are relayed to JPL over a series of communication routes that include satellite links and dedicated network lines. Like the DSN, the Galileo telemetry system further refines the data and separates the various science instruments and engineering data into individual files. These files are sent to other project systems and at the same time stored in an extensive database where each member of the Galileo flight team can retrieve needed data and information. Each element of the Galileo flight team performs analysis on the returning data to determine exact position of the spacecraft, how well it is operating and whether anything needs immediate attention. All of this information is provided to the scientists along with the science data. Fatigue is brushed aside as each science team analyzes the returning data. Each piece of data is treated like a diamond, examined for flaws as well as perfection. Each member of each science team searches deep into the data for a hint of new discoveries and confirmation of old theories. First the idea, then the people, working together year after year, until one day, almost unexpected, the idea is realized, and old mysteries are solved, and new mysteries emerge, and a new idea, a new plan, a new journey. Hi, we're back now with uh, Torrance Johnson and uh, Carl Sagan. Um, we are, uh, we are at the uh, top of the hour. We're about uh, six minutes away from the end of the burn. Uh, Torrance tells me that if we burn for another four or five minutes, we'll probably be in a safe orbit around Jupiter, but uh, we really want to do the nominal 49-minute burn. And uh, I think things are going still uh, very well. If we look at the Doppler plot, uh, we can see that uh, we are inching our way toward the bottom of the screen there and, uh, and getting toward that area. One well, the arrow's moving. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it, once that, uh, that plot flattens out uh, in a line uh, parallel to the top line, uh, we will be there. We will be in orbit around Jupiter for uh, starting our two-year tour. And remembering that we may have a period of being out of block with the signal because of the change in frequency right at the end of the burn. Right. Carl, welcome. Thank it's good you. to see you here. Thank you. Happy uh, to be here. Another encounter. Another encounter. Another notch in your belt. <laughs> well, another great encounter. And uh, I'm just so glad that after all these perils of Pauline that uh, the entry probe entered, that the tape recorder is recording, that the, the burn to achieve orbital insertion is burning. Mm -hmm. uh, all that's just terrific good news. Give us, a, give us a perspective on your reaction to the, the probe data. I mean, that's really the plum in this, uh, in this whole uh, day. Oh, oh, yeah. It's the conceptual novelty. I mean, uh, we, we have flown through the Jupiter system before. Mm -hmm. uh, four spacecraft. Uh, none of them can hold a candle to what Galileo will do. But still, it's not a conceptual novelty, um, although orbiting a Jovian planet is. But an entry probe into a Jovian planet, that is a conceptual novelty. Right. And, uh, and there we'll no longer have to deduce from chemical equilibrium where the clouds are. We will pass through the clouds. We will be able to see the, the particles and the dilution of sunlight 
We won't have to guess what the chemistry, and especially the organic chemistry, is. We'll have actual data, hands-on data. I mean, it's, it's really epical in the history we're, of planetary exploration. The whole mission is. We're literally feeling the wind on our faces in yeah, terms yeah, of the yeah, probe. That's well, not literally, but... but uh, no. <laughs> figuratively. <laughs> figuratively, we are. The spacecraft is literally, and we're figuratively. Right. And I, I think it's really significant, too, Carl, that this is a totally different type of atmosphere. I mean, we have put entry probes into Venus and, obviously, the Earth and, and into Mars. And those are all very interesting atmospheres, but evolved atmospheres. Jupiter's is the first time we've looked at anything like this that goes back that far with so little change. Well, where the major constituents are, uh, are unevolved, but right. the minor constituents might be highly Very evolved. interesting yeah. history, maybe. Yeah. We're going to uh, briefly go over to the navigations area, see what's going on there with David Seidel. David, can you hear us? Sure can, Rich. And uh, with me is Dr. Jenny Johansson of the navigation team. And, uh, and Rich, a moment ago, like in the <coughs> having wind in, wind in your face, and I guess that, that's kind of the feeling of exhilaration that you guys must feel. How, how does it look to you from, uh, from your position here? Things look pretty good. I think everything looks, uh, looks at least they're tracking the spacecraft. It looks pretty good. And we have a slight underperformance, but we'll be watching very carefully now where we're going to cut off the burn. Okay, and if there's an underperformance or whatever, what's the responsibility of this team at that point? To well, well, we'll be designing OTM-1 or deciding whether there should be an OTM-1. Um, everything enters in whether the IO flyby is as we thought it was, uh, low, and whether um, the performance is under or over what is expected. So it's a matter of taking accounting of all the performance factors that went into right. the spacecraft trajectory and then designing the, ne the, re the next part of the trajectory. The, right. uh, what's explain an OTM? Um, we have a, our first correction maneuver um, on Saturday, and that's our first orbit trim maneuver, OTM-1, and so we'll be designing that. Um, but there's a good possibility that we may not end up doing it. We may go to a slightly different Ganymede-1 date, and therefore we wouldn't need to, to do an OTM-1. So the team goes back to work then? We'll, we'll be working tonight, for sure but the decision would be made later Great. tomorrow. Well, thank you and congratulations. And just to set the scene, uh, since we were here earlier in the afternoon, it's gotten more crowded in here. And I, I wouldn't say that, that uh, everyone is, is perfectly silent. I think uh, the good measure is there's about 15 M&Ms left. When the M&Ms are gone, the spacecraft will be in orbit. Back to you, Rich. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, let's go around to the lab and uh, see how people are reacting to, uh, to the uh, waiting for the news. This is Von Karman Auditorium, and uh, people are patiently waiting for the engine cutoff. Again, the final moment. Uh, at this point, uh, a rough educated guess would be that we are now in orbit around Jupiter. We've burned sufficiently long to be in orbit. And the burn should continue. The burn. The burn should be continuing for at least another couple minutes and getting us in exactly the kind of orbit we want to be in around Jupiter. Okay, uh, so far, so good. And uh, we've now achieved enough burn to, uh, to get us into orbit. We are now uh, a natural, a, an artificial satellite of the Jupiter system. 
We now have to wait to make sure that the engine cuts off at the right time so that the, uh, the orbital tour can be conducted properly. I guess if we cut off too early, the uh, initial orbit around Jupiter would be much longer than the 200 uh, days for the nominal orbit. And so we don't want to do that. We want to uh, keep that burn as close to nominal as possible so that we don't have to correct that later on with, uh, with fuel. Right. So our, our fuel propellant budget is uh, one of our major things that we keep an eye on because it means the resource to do science with once we're in orbit, to do the tour, to do these billiard shots. Okay, we're coming up on uh, about another two minutes for the engine cutoff. support area, everyone watching the Doppler plot. data point comes every six seconds. This is the Doppler plot. And remember that we may lose lock when the engine cuts off, which is normal. It's expected. The uh, accelerometers on the spacecraft right now are okay. measuring the amount of acceleration achieved when uh, they determine that Galileo has enough acceleration, they'll cut the engines off. We're waiting on that moment right now. It's the mission support uh, area. People are waiting on that. Obviously nervously bouncing around as we are here in the studio, as everyone is all over the lab. Doppler plot is uh, Still indicating. Oh, we've got something. We've got an engine cutoff. Information. We are there. We've had a successful burn. We're having reactions around the laboratory as the NASA Administrator Dan Golden in the spotlights. Oh, we're there and we're going to stay there. We're there. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. MSA, everybody is very, very happy right now. The big push, the big events of the day have now occurred and they've occurred successfully. Uh, let's see if we can get in contact with Bill O'Neill. He must be pretty happy.
Bill, can you uh, hear us there? Yes, we can hear you fine, and uh, it is my distinct pleasure to declare not only are we in orbit, but we're in a very good orbit. Uh, we're absolutely uh, ecstatic. Our two momentous events of, events of the day are now accomplished, and uh, we have a great mission ahead of us. So we had cut off on the engine be, uh, from the gyros then, right? Accelerometers is, uh, we're uh, confirming that uh, momentarily, but the indication is accelerometer cut off, yes. Okay, that's very, very good news. And again, congratulations to everybody. This, is, this has been a monumental day. You bet. Two monuments. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when there was, uh, when orbital ignition began, but, uh, but not yet uh, achieving orbit, uh, uh, Dan Golden was giving high fives to people who I don't think had ever had an, a high five in their <laughs> lives. <laughs> it looks like this was extremely precise. It's, uh, I, a lot of credit goes to our, our German colleagues and the, the precision of that, uh, that uh, rocket and the machine that they built and all of our attitude control and and uh, uh, mission team engineers. It looks like everything was right on the money. And it all working after such a long period of time in, in space. Yes. That's right, space and on the ground. And I mean, on the ground, uh, unanticipated yeah. delays. Well, this has been a big day for Jupiter as well f as for us. It's, uh, it saw its first artificial shooting star and now it has its first artificial satellite. I, I suspect <laughs> Jupiter is very blasé about such <laughs> event stars. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, give us a little bit of uh, perspective on that. A lot of the questions we get are, uh, you know, is Galileo going to search for life? Uh, what are the prospects of, uh, of, of life in the Jovian system? And maybe you can give us a little bit of a uh, perspective on that. Well, I mean, the, the first thing to say is that nobody knows. And uh, if we did know, you would have heard about it before now. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think it's out of the question. It's not something to be dismissed uh, by contemplating your navel. You dismiss it by doing investigations and Galileo turns out to be a very powerful instrument. Um, where might we look? Uh, the uh, possible subsurface ocean of Europa that you guys were talking about before is a very interesting environment. If there's liquid water, it's roughly room temperature. Um, it's in the dark all right, uh, but there are cracks and maybe light gets down and beyond that we now know of ecosystems on the earth that live in the dark in the, in the ocean bottoms. And uh, while we're not going to send some part of Galileo down subsurface, there's a very good uh, chance of elucidating uh, much better our knowledge of uh, what's happening on Europa. Then on Jupiter, uh, the minimal statement you might uh, make safely is that uh, organic chemistry is happening. We know of some simple uh, hydrocarbons in the atmosphere. Uh, we know from laboratory simulations, our laboratory in, at Cornell and elsewhere, that if you uh, UV irradiate or a charged particle irradiate or lightning irradiate a Jovian atmosphere, you get a very nice mixture of complex organics. And the including amino acids. Uh, including amino acids if you're down in the liquid water right. uh, clouds. Now we have almost no data from the liquid water clouds. We're not only going to have data from there, we're going to have a probe passing into it, through it, and getting organic chemistry from somewhere in the vicinity of it. Uh, so even if the abundance of organic chemicals in the free atmosphere is low, mm -hmm. because of lightning in the, the water clouds and for other reasons, you might expect there to be higher amounts in the water clouds. That's going to be very exciting. And if there isn't any organic chemistry there, that's very interesting. How come? Why not? And then the, uh, the most wild speculation, which I can legitimately describe it as such since I did it mm -hmm. with, the, <laughs> with my colleague at Saul Peter of, uh, of Cornell, is that there might be life in the atmosphere of, uh, of Jupiter. And if there is substantial organic chemistry and there's stuff to eat, and there are ways that are easy to imagine of uh, organisms not being rapidly carried down to their depths at, you know, great depths. Uh, uh, no guarantee, of course, and certainly no guarantee that we would find it, but still it's a possibility to bear in mind. Even if there were no organic chemistry and no biological possibilities, Galileo is going to do wonders. It's, from, from my point of view, 
it's sort of like uh, it's your birthday. And uh, your, your parents have permitted you to see that there's this big pile of presents. <laughs> but you can't open them yet. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you're going to have to open them slowly on pre-assigned times. Mm -hmm. And that's the story we're in. We don't know what's in them, but we know that it's going to be great. Right. And they'll let you run through the room uh, a few days earlier uh, <laughs> see those presents. You want to go back and start unwrapping them. Right, right, right. And you can't. <laughs> the absolute law of nature that is not permitted until a certain time. And that's the same situation we're in. Yeah. Another thing I think about, Rich, is, uh, you know, only a thousand years ago, uh, nobody thought of Jupiter as a, as a world. It was a mm -hmm. point of light in the sky. It was a God. It was a spirit. It, was, it wasn't a place. And uh, we really knew nothing, nothing about it. Cultures all over the world identified it with the king of the gods. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the king of the gods. We're quite sure of that now. But look what it is. It's this giant world, a kind of star that failed. And uh, uh, as Torrance said a moment ago, very different from the Earth and the other inner planets in the solar system. And there we are at it, finding out what, what it's about. And in just this last few months, there has been a credible uh, announcement of a discovery of another Jupiter-like planet right. around a very different star, 51 Pegasi. That's right. And so what we're doing here is not just studying the Jupiter in our system, but in a certain sense, the whole category of Jupiters of which if the 51 Pegasi discovery is right, there must be an enormous number uh, around nearby stars. So there's a whole new genre, category, of, uh, of things to explore. It's an epical time in the history of human exploration. That's great. That, that's exactly right. In, in, uh, <clears throat> we've reached a threshold in, in terms of exploring our own solar system and discovering worlds around other planets, uh, around other stars. And, uh, and as you said, the, the discovery around uh, 51 Pegasus was uh, a, a indication of a spectrum around that world exactly like the spectrum we're seeing in Jupiter. Methane gas in that atmosphere. No, no, not, not, not in 51 Pegasus. Oh, that's that a, was, that was that's this uh, uh, geezy. Yes. Uh, oh, we're but discovering too many solar systems. It's, it's hard to keep up. So all of a sudden, in the last month, suddenly we have uh, suddenly there enough extra solar planets to get confused over. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what a better but, world. But, I mean, the technology has now, in, in many different approaches, reached the threshold. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of other ways of detecting planets around other stars that are just slightly sub-threshold right, right now. In the next few years, we'll see them achieve threshold. So in 20 years, we might actually inventory the planetary systems around hundreds of other, of other stars and then think how much perspective we will have on our own system, uh, whether it's very common, this is the way systems always are, or whether it's just one of a very broad variety of systems, uh, maybe ours even uh, idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, we, uh, we talked about the formation of the planets, and, and it was always some extraordinary event. Some star nearly crashed into our star and set off a flare that, that created our solar system. And, and now I guess we've come to discover that the process of planetary formation may actually be something very common. And we're starting to uh, understand that within our own solar system, and we're starting to see that in, uh, in other solar systems, as, in other uh, stellar systems as well. Yeah. And that's part of the whole evolution since Copernicus, away from us being unique, the center of the universe, the reason that there is a universe, and uh, the growing perception that in almost every respect we are a cosmic commonplace. Uh, it's great to be average, isn't it, uh, with the prospect <laughs> of having other uh, worlds out there, uh, perhaps even similar to our own, and perhaps even inhabited. Uh, absolutely. And the technology for detecting other life is almost in hand uh, uh, on planets of other stars. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, once we can separate the, uh, the light from the parent star from the light of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the planet, then we can start to make spectral measurements and look for disequilibrium products in the, in the exactly. kinds of signatures that may be, uh, may be common to biological processes. Exactly. It's a very exciting moment to, uh, to be alive and interested in, in these issues. Oh, this is great. And who can be interested? You've got to be made of wood not to want to know where your planet comes from, where you come from. That's right. You know, I, uh, I'm often asked the question uh, whether, uh, whether I believe there's, uh, there's life out there. And when you think of the enormity of numbers, the fact that uh, there, are, there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy and hundreds of billions of galaxies, 
uh, quite literally, there are more stars, more potential sites for planets and, and life than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of this planet. And, you know, if you go to the beach and, and run those uh, grains of sand through your hand, it's, it, you'd have to be crazy to believe we're the only ones out here. I mean, it's I, barely possible, but, but to conclude that we're unique is, is, is crazy. Yeah, that's I insane. think it's very important to go back to the point Carl made earlier, too, is the way you advance in these areas is to make measurements, not just theorize and speculate. And that's what we're about to do with Galileo, looking at our own system. I mean, that's to find out not just what we think might be there, but what is there. Okay, um, it's time to read the uh, Galileo official status, which actually, unless I read this, it, it's not official, but uh, uh, project engineers report that the, the spacecraft's rocket fired on time at 5.20 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and stopped 49 minutes as planned, stopped after 49 minutes as planned at 6.08 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, enabling the spacecraft to enter orbit around the giant planet and begin a two-year mission of scientific studies. So there it is. It's official. We are, uh, we've now read the press release, and we are in orbit. Uh, by Joe, that's been precision. And uh, so, so uh, what you else? Know, we're, we're, we're winding down, and I, I wanted to say on air that having, uh, having watched uh, intermittently uh, during the day uh, this particular program, I, I think you've done an extraordinary job, Rich, and, uh, in uh, conveying in a uh, straightforward and uh, a way, with not talking down to the audience, and. Uh, uh, not oversimplifying either, uh, and conveying the excitement. Uh, I think you've really done a, an ideal job, and I just wanted to congratulate you. Well, thank you, Carl, and I'll pay you for that comment later. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Torrance, you've, uh, just, just give me a personal perspective on this. What, what time did your day start today? I actually got up pretty much at the normal hour, because I knew we'd be going by Europa's orbit at 6, so that was okay. And okay. then I got into the lab and started checking in on how things were going, found out that the spacecraft was doing what it was supposed to, and started getting a little more comfortable. By noon, when we were by Io and everything was still going well, I was feeling good. Getting that probe signal confirmation was really a high point. Now, here we are in orbit. It's fantastic. It is fantastic. Um, we're going to go again to uh, David Seidel at the uh, navigations area. David? Yeah, Rich. Well, uh, I, I think it's uh, important for, for my team here to point out that they actually uh, started clapping before the MSA did. Uh, they saw in their data, the, the, uh, the high-resolution data and tracking plots that they were doing, that the spacecraft was in orbit and the burn had taken place. And uh, I, the M&Ms are gone. They've broken out the, the lemonade here. And uh, it's, it's been, it was very exciting being here for, for this event. And, of course, everybody's really happy and celebrating, looking forward to really challenging two years ahead uh, for this team in order to collect the science. And I think the, uh, the only message that uh, can be left from this lab here is for, uh, is for uh, Carl and especially Torrance, and that's uh, time to go to work, guys. Okay, well, thank you, David. Uh, that's great. Um, gentlemen, uh, we have a couple last uh, questions from the Internet here. Uh, uh, Torrance, you want to uh, feel these? Uh, one of them is, what is the Galileo core made of? Or will, will Galileo determine what the, what the core is made out of? I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you answer. The, the core of Jupiter. The core of, the Jupiter. core of Jupiter. Yes, and uh, the answer to that is that will remain a bit of a mystery. Uh, we will get new data to infer what that region deep inside Jupiter will be like. But we will, of course, not measure it directly with the probe and we have no instruments to measure that directly. That still is in the realm of taking data and putting them into theories. The second question would what concern the, the vaporization of the probe and how hot the atmosphere of Jupiter had to be to do that. By the time the aluminum and titanium is melting, we're down at uh, thousands of bars of pressure and thousands of degrees centigrade temperatures. And uh, it's amazing to think that that probe that was up in the cold upper stratosphere of Jupiter at 3 o'clock this afternoon uh, got so rapidly to those, to those depths in the atmosphere where that would happen. Yeah, that's really amazing. And it's about eight hours or so um, until the, uh, the, the aluminum finally, I mean the uh, titanium finally right. vaporizes. That's correct. And there's uh, basically nothing left of the core except uh, of the uh, probe except uh, being part of uh, Jupiter. And indistinguishable from all those other atoms, of which there must be many, of titanium and aluminum. And That's right. There's uh, stuff. there's uh, nothing new that uh, Jupiter hasn't seen before. And uh, as you pointed out uh, to me earlier, that uh, Jupiter is constantly being bombarded by uh, by a mix of things, of cometary material. We've seen that with the uh, Shoe uh, Comet Shoemaker Levy Nine. And uh, as Carl said, 
uh, Jupiter's seen this before. It just hasn't seen something coming in from this particular point of origin. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. And, and in this particular uh, arrangement of atoms, it's, yes. it's certainly right. Okay. Any uh, any uh, closing remarks that you'd like to make uh, on well, the? I, uh, I started my scientific career looking at Jupiter, still very much like Carl's analogy of the ancient astronomers as a point of light, and they really became the Jupiter and the the system around Jupiter became a place with Voyager, and all I can say now is it's nice to be back in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. Absolutely. Carl? Um, I guess all I'd like to say uh, beyond my absolute delight after spending 20 years off and on on this, the, that it's working, is that I hope the uh, sense of excitement and the great discoveries that are surely ahead of us will uh, uh, convey to uh, the American people and to those who control the purse strings the uh, importance of uh, continuing the very basic human activity of exploring places we've never been before. Absolutely. Uh, again, thank you very much for, uh, for coming here. I appreciate that. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank everybody out there in uh, guest operations, our visitors to the lab, uh, in particular the family and friends of the, uh, the, the teams of people who've put together Galileo, because it's without the support of uh, family and friends, it just would have made the job that much harder. And, uh, and finally, I'd like to close with a, uh, a personal observation of today's events. Uh, I hope you've been watching this program because you're curious. Because it's that quality that has really built our world. It drove us to make the tools from rocks initially, to explore our planet, to find new ones, and build machines like Galileo to explore them. But Galileo is more than just a piece of machinery. It's also a symbol. It is a monument to human curiosity, a test of our technology, and an extension of our brains and senses into the frontiers of exploration. I hope you will continue to be curious and follow this adventure as it unfolds over the next two years. All of Galileo's messages of exotic worlds and fantastic landscapes are gifts we should all share and pass on. Because we go to Jupiter, not for our scientists and engineers, but for all of us, and especially for our children. This is Rich Terrell, an astronomer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, thanking you for watching on behalf of NASA and the Galileo Project. Good night.